Okay, everyone, we are going to go ahead and get started. First, I just want to say thank you. I want to say thank you so much to everyone who is joining this webinar that's all about investing in real estate. We have a bunch of people who have registered for this webinar who are either listening in live or who are going to listen to the recording. And in either case, we are just really grateful that you are connecting with us uh, through this webinar. My name is Eric Thompson. I am your host as we go through this information today. So uh, my role is I am president of Windermere Services here in Colorado. You should know that I've been in the real estate business now for 24 years. So I've helped lots of clients um, through those years, help them to acquire investment property. And I also own investment property myself. It's been a big part of my own personal strategy on uh, building for retirement, building my own wealth is through investment real estate. So you need to know that. You need to know that uh, as we embark that I'm a big believer uh, in what I'm about to show you. And uh, again, I'm just grateful that, uh, that all of you have joined. Uh, what I can promise you is a few things. You're going to get some really great takeaways today, um, things that you can implement immediately, and you're going to have a ton of clarity about what it really takes to own investment real estate. You're going to see all the numbers uh, that go into this. Um, uh, there's no test at the end, which is really good news for you. I can promise you that. We're not going to email you a test. And I can also promise you that we're going to have a whole lot of fun as we go through this together. So hopefully that's all right with you that we uh, have some fun. Um, let's do this as we start. For all of you listening in live and a bunch of you are listening in live, uh, if you would do me a favor, would you type in using the GoToWebinar platform, would you type in a comment to me um, saying that you can hear me? I just want to make sure that I am coming through loud and clear. I want to make sure you can hear me okay. And I see those comments are starting to roll in right now. So that's fantastic. It's always good to know that uh, everyone can hear me all right. And they're uh, rolling in here fast and furious. This is also uh, good practice for you because we'll have time at the end to take questions and uh, how you are Notifying me that you can hear me is the exact way that you can ask me questions. So rest assured, we will take questions at the end. We'll make sure that we have uh, some time for that. So all of you listening live will have that benefit to be able to ask questions. And uh, of course, I love questions because everyone um, will get something out of your question. They may be wondering the same thing. So we encourage questions. Um, okay, so here we go. So this is all about how to get started investing in real estate. So what this is going to be very much about, this is about the basics. So maybe you've wondered about investing in real estate. Maybe you have friends or family that do it. You've heard about it. You've read about it. You see it on TV. And so you just wonder about it. And maybe it's what's kept you from doing it up until now is you just even don't know how to start. You don't know how, how uh, the process looks. You don't know the steps. And what this webinar is going to do, it's going to clarify all of that for you. Okay. So this is very much about the basics. This is exactly how to get started in real estate. And I'll tell you um, right up front here, there's some things that, to be clear with you, there's some things that this is not. Okay. There's uh, three things here that this is not. Number one, this has nothing to do with schemes. All right. So um, these things that we show you aren't going to cause money to start like raining out of the sky all of a sudden. You know, you're not just going to uh, wake up um, and uh, see your bank account, you know, has tripled overnight or anything, you know, there, so no, no schemes involved here. Hopefully that's, that's all right with you. I'm guessing that it is. This also has nothing to do with like no money down kind of um, uh, schemes or programs. Uh, this won't remind you of anything that you may have come across on late night TV or, you know, anything, anything like that. You know, this, this is going to be some pretty straightforward stuff. Also, this is not anything to do with how to flip. Now, I think that uh, for some people, flipping can be a really great strategy. It can work really well. Some people are uh, you know, just naturally inclined to be able to go out and, and find good homes to flip and do that work themselves even and, and flip homes. I do think that flipping can be a good strategy, but that's like a different webinar. We're not going to cover that today. So this has nothing to do with, with how to flip homes. All right. So I just want to be totally upfront about what this is uh, and what this is not. So uh, hopefully it's all right. It's, we're not going to show you any schemes or any no money down programs. And also we're not going to show you how to flip homes. What this is about, uh, three things that this is very much about, this is very much about, as we go through this, it's very much about step-by-step. -step. So I'm just going to show you the very simple step-by-step -step basics, how this works and, and how to get started. This also is very much about long-term. So um, what we share here in this webinar, you'll see that we take a long-term approach. We have a long-term 
mindset to this. There's some real benefits to having that kind of a mindset and, and that approach. This is very much about long term. And also, this is very much about real life. So I'm going to share a, a personal real life story just so you can really get it. Um, you can see a real life example about um, what happens when when you invest in real estate and, and what the upsides can be and really just how simple and straightforward this is, all right? So that's a little bit about what this is not and also about what this is. Is that all right with you? Are you guys okay, okay with that? I'm hoping that the answer uh, is yes. Um, real quick, I'm guessing there's a lot of you on this webinar who have um, tuned in live or listening to the recording. You already know about Windermere Real Estate. If you don't, just real quick, a little bit about our company. This is where we're located. So we're located in these states that are all shaded in. That's where our, our company is located. Um, we have uh, about 6,000 agents all across those states. Uh, we have about 300 offices. We now have seven offices in Colorado, all up and down the Front Range, here to serve you. And I'm guessing you already know about this because I'm guessing a Windermere agent has invited you, but that's just a quick reminder, all right? I encourage you to stay until the end so that we can show you how to get some valuable resources. Uh, for instance, our investment checklist is something that we'll offer you at the end, and I'll tell you exactly how to get that. Uh, plus, there's a couple other things that we can offer to you as resources that we think will really help you out. So make sure you stay to the end so you can hear how to get those things, all right? Uh, one more thing, kind of housekeeping, before we get too far into this. Um, and this is to make our lawyers happy. Um, as we talk about investing in real estate, just be sure as part of your process, not only are you consulting with us, you're also consulting with your accountant and your attorney. You know, they're a key part of this. Um, you really need to do this. You need to do this with any real estate transaction, especially when it's investing in real estate. So this is our disclaimer. You wanna be sure to consult with your accountant and, and your attorney. You know, we, we can't promise any kind of financial return on anything uh, related to investing in real estate. We'll go through the benefits um, and be sure to consult with your accountant and your attorney. And now that our lawyers are happy, let's get into this. Okay, uh, so here we go. I want to start this today, if it's all right with you. I'm going to start this with a story, and this is a personal story. I'm going to tell you the story of, about one of my own rental properties because I think it's very instructive. I think it's going to help you out to show you uh, the power of investing in real estate and also how simple this can be. What you're looking at is a picture of one of the rental properties that I own. It's in Fort Collins. Uh, it's up in the north part of Fort Collins. And I'm going to walk you through what has happened uh, because of me owning this home. So this is um, it's a little three bedroom, 1100 square foot home. You can see it has a two car garage, uh, doesn't have a basement. Uh, it's in a great little neighborhood, good location. Um, you know, it's not like right in downtown Fort Collins. It's, it's kind of on the outskirts, but it's, it's a great little neighborhood. So the address of this home is uh, 1039 Berwick. And I say 2013 here on the screen because that's when I bought it. So in the summer of 2013, so about five years ago, is when I purchased this home. So I purchased this home five years ago as an investment. And the purchase price back then, what I paid for that home was $180,000. All right. So I paid $180,000. For that home in 2013, um, lucky for me that the price has gone up and we'll, we'll talk more about that. But that's that was the value back in 2013. Purchased that home. Actually, I purchased it from another investor, someone else who had that in, as an investment home. And when I purchased this home, I purchased it with 35% down. Now, I could have gone as low as 25% down. And there, there are even ways to go to 20% down that we'll talk about more later. But I chose to put 35% down as my down payment for this home. So that equates to $63,000. So $63,000 $63, was my down payment. And of course, I had a few thousand more in, in closing costs and, and those kind of things that uh, when I initially acquired the home. But this was the, the bulk of my upfront investment was $63,000, which was my uh, down payment. So again, I could have I could have got, gone down to 25%, um, but I chose to do 35%. So that meant that my monthly payment, and my monthly payment includes here, what I'm showing you, that includes my principal and interest on my mortgage. It also includes my property taxes and also my insurance. My monthly payment was 1067 a month, and, and still is 1067 a month. And I chose, at that time, I chose to do a 15-year loan. Now, I could have chosen to do a 30-year loan, but I chose a 15-year loan. I chose 15-year loan because I, I just wanted to get that property paid down quicker. And, and I saw that because I was putting 
a, just a you know a pretty sizable down payment down in that house. You know, I was doing 35%, not 25, that I I could keep that monthly payment kind of you know in in line, keep it at a reasonable amount, even with a 15-year loan, and there would be some benefits to the 15-year loan in that I could get the principal paid down quicker. All right. So then I had a renter in that property for $1,250 a month. So pretty straightforward, right? So again, five years ago, I bought this home for $180,000, chose to put 35% down. That was $63,000. So I got a loan, which meant my monthly payment was $1,067. And I was able to rent that property for a little bit more than my monthly payment, which meant that I had a little bit more to set aside for, for maintenance and for the just the couple of weeks that it sat bank at, over those five years. I, I never had a problem getting renters in there. I had three different renters in there over the five years. Never had a problem getting a new renter in. Because I was renting it for a little bit more than the monthly payment, I was covered. Um, I was always uh, at, at least breaking even, if not cash flow positive. And this has worked really, really well. Now, this property today is about to go on the market. So it actually, as we speak, it's interesting, this um, this is about to go on the market uh, tomorrow. <laughs> so that for all of you listening live, this property is going on the market tomorrow. And I'm, I'm listing it because I want to trade it up to a larger um, a larger uh, property, okay? So I, I, w I just want to get a larger um, investment home and that's so that's why I'm going to list it. And I'm also listing it because it's it's done pretty well uh, as an investment, it's appreciated uh, really well. So it's going to go on the market at 280000 based on the comparable sales, um, based on what's happening in the market, all the analysis. It will sell for 280000 I know that. Um, so 280000 is the sales price that will um, go on the market tomorrow. Uh, a question came in, did I have a property manager? I did. I chose to have a property manager. And I will talk more about property managers here uh, in a little bit it, just for for – my uh, kind of my MO and my style, I chose to have a property manager, but I, I didn't need to have one. Uh, so 280000 is the sales price. Today, my loan balance sits at 92000 So as you see this, what you're realizing is that I, I'm blessed in this home with, with quite, a bit, quite a bit of equity uh, in this home, right? So I've, uh, I have um, $188,000 of equity um, sitting there in this home. So what what happened over five years is my sixty three thousand dollars became one hundred eighty eight thousand dollars. And again, this is we're not talking schemes here. You know, money is not raining uh, from the sky. But because two things were happening over those five years, I was able to create this equity in this little eleven $1 hundred square foot home. The two things that were happening is number one, I had a renter in that home who was paying my mortgage down for me. So they were, they were paying me rent and I was sending that rent basically right over to my mortgage company. And every month my loan balance was going down and my renter was doing that for me. So that was building equity. And then on top of that, the market uh, was going up, right? The market was appreciating. Um, lucky for me, and, and we'll go through the kind of the history of market appreciation here in the front range of, of Colorado. So today I sit with $188,000 of equity. And yes, there'll be some some sales costs that, that I'll have when, it, when I sell the property. But this is just simple, straightforward on what happened with this home. So this is an example of, of the power of investing in real estate. This little house doesn't even have a basement, three bedroom, two bath house, paid 180,000 for it. And look, look what's happened today. And I'm gonna take this equity, go reinvest it into another rental property because I believe in this um, so, so much, right? So. Here's the deal. Real estate is um, a few things, okay? Real estate is, number one, it's straightforward. You know, it's, it's a house. <laughs> and there aren't many things more straightforward than a house. You know, we all, we live in houses. We grew up in houses. People understand houses. Um, and for the most part, people are getting a mortgage. Uh, when they buy a house, you can pay cash, of course, but most people are getting a mortgage. Mortgages are pretty straightforward. Yes, there's some there's a qualification process you go through, but real estate is very straightforward. Real estate is also tangible. What I appreciate about real estate is that I can go drive by uh, the rental properties that I own. I can drive by and, and check on them. I can go inside of them if I want to. I can meet my renters. I can shake their hand if I want to. So real estate, one, another thing I like is real estate is a very tangible thing. And the other thing I like is that real estate is desirable. You know, it really comes down to the fact that people need a house to live in. You know, it's one of the, the three basic needs that people have. You know, people need 
food, clothing, and shelter, right? And so we're providing one of those needs um, by our investment real estate. We're giving someone a place to live. And the other great news for us as we think about investing in Colorado and specifically the Front Range, the Front Range is a very desirable place to live. There are a whole bunch of people who are moving here. We all know that because we spend time on I-25 and we see the traffic and we read the stories about all the people who are moving here and we read, read the stories about the shortages of housing. So housing is desirable. That's what I love about real estate as opposed to, as opposed to, how about opposed to Bitcoin, right? So I'll respect anyone that's investing in Bitcoin, but I tell you what, Bitcoin is not straightforward at all. You know, I, I cannot understand Bitcoin. You know, I've read about it. Um, I try to get, try to understand it. I don't, I don't know about you, but I do not understand Bitcoin. Bitcoin is not tangible. Bitcoin is a bunch of numbers on a screen. And in terms of desirability, I guess it's desirable for a certain segment of the population. You know, I, I read that uh, people into Bitcoin, they tend to be like drug dealers and pirates and, and people like that. And, you know, that uh, real estate doesn't really attract people like that. Again, I'll respect anyone that's investing uh, in Bitcoin, but, you know, investing in real estate is a whole, di a whole lot different than investing in Bitcoin. And, and also real estate is different as opposed to the stock market. And it, believe me, I, I believe in diversity. I have money in the, in the stock market and the stock market can be really confusing. The stock market it, is not necessarily straightforward. Um, it can be super confusing. Um, it's not tangible. That's a frustration I have uh, about the stock market. And, you know, there, it takes these wild swings. You know, remember that day, it was about six weeks ago, the, the stock market crashed like 10% in one day. And I appreciated that my real estate didn't go down by 10% in one day. So what I encourage is diversity, right? So yes, have money in the stock market and have some money in real estate too, because there's some uh, really different benefits that real estate can provide as opposed to the stock market. All right. So that was just for fun to talk about Bitcoin and, and the stock market. Now let's, let's look at the real estate market. Okay. Let's look at the real estate market. And I'm going to show you this uh, really interesting and, and really valuable chart that we, we refer to quite a bit. I'm going to blow it up on the screen so it's nice and big. And uh, let's go through this, all right? So what you're looking at is the Metro Denver market. And I will tell you that for a, the bunch of you who are listening from both Larimer County and Weld County, know two things. Know that the pattern is pretty much the same in those other areas of the front range and also know that we can get you this chart for larimer or weld county if you're curious to see it we just don't have time to show all the different markets on the front range but just know that the pattern is very much the same and what you're looking at for the metro denver market is a history going all the way back here to 1977 of year by year price appreciation in the real estate market so <clears throat> let's just pick a year let's say for example 1997 right here, the real estate market went up that year 6.41%. So prices went up 6.41%. And then the next year, they went up another 6.68%. And then the next year, they went up 12.93%. So each blue bar represents that particular year's price appreciation. So what you'd look at uh, first, what you probably will notice as you glance at this is uh, good news for us. There's a lot more bars going up than going down. Here was a down year, 1987, prices went down 4.36%. So more up years than down years, that, that's a good thing. The other thing that you may notice is we had this stretch right here when the real estate bubble burst where prices went down. But what's interesting is then, you know, really the worst economy of our lifetime, prices along the front range were going down just over 2%. So 2008 was a terrible year for real estate across the country, and yet, Prices on the front range are only going down about 2%, followed by a year of down 1%. Compare that to a place like Miami, which was down well over 20%, or Las Vegas or Phoenix, well over 20%. So our market tends to stay pretty well insulated from swings like that. You should know that the long-term average, so over these 40 years, this is now 40 years of data, the average for the front range for the Denver metro market is 5.63%. So that's the 40-year average. You can see recently in the last few years, we've been um, going above that average. But what's really interesting, if you were to look at this 10 year snapshot, this 10 years is right along the lines of that 40 year average. So 
really the, what's happening in these recent years is we're compensating for these down years to get the market back to what it's always done over time, which is appreciated about 5.5%. So again, the long-term average is 5.63%. So the purpose of showing you this graph is just to show you over the long term, the front range market really performs. You know, um, Certainly there are down years, but there are more up years than down. And what we know over the long term, and this is based on 40 years of data, the market goes up by about 5.5% per year. We don't expect that these prices can continue this pace. Uh, we expect the pace of appreciation to eventually slow down. We, we don't imagine double-digit price appreciation to keep occurring year after year after year. We expect this to get uh, back closer to the long-term average of being about 5.5%. For the market to turn and, and prices to go down would take something really catastrophic, you know, something, some big external um, change in, in the market or the word, world politics or something. And, you know, again, look what happened in the worst economy of our lifetime. Prices went down just over 2%. So we want to show you this is to um, just give you an idea of how the market has performed uh, over the long term. Again, what you need to know, it's about 5.5% uh, per year. So as you build out your models, as we plug in numbers to imagine what prices may do over the long term, that's a good reference point for us is that the fact that along the front range, prices have gone up about 5.5% per year, okay? Uh, now, how about vacancy rates? Vacancy rates are always a question. Uh, people wonder about vacancy rates, of course, when they think about investing in real estate. What I did in preparation for this webinar, I, I just went to the state of Colorado's Division of Housing website, and I just took a screenshot. So this image right here is just a, a screenshot right from that website. So again, the state of Colorado Division of Housing, you can see it right here. So you can see what's happening for vacancy rates all across Colorado. So uh, most of these cities, of course, are along the front range. They also decided to include Grand Junction. So these are the, the larger cities in Colorado. And what you need to know is that any number that's near 5% is, is very, very healthy. You know, some people say who are savvy about investing in real estate that 5% vacancy rate is essentially 0% vacancy rate. You know, 5% vacancy is essentially no vacancy. So any number that's near 5% shows a very healthy market. Certainly anything under 10% is good. So what we notice here is that the Denver metro area is at 6.4%. The Springs at 54 Northern Colorado, um, both at Fort Collins, Loveland and, and Greeley, even lower than that, 3% here in Larimer County and then 2.2% in Weld County. Um, pretty um, significantly low numbers. So this is good news for you as you think about potentially investing in real estate. You're going to wonder, well, what are my chances that the property sits vacant? Given, again, that the front range is such a desirable, desirable place to live, that so many people are moving here, that's what causes these vacancy rates to be so, so low. So now let me take you through, let me take you through a really simple four-part formula, okay? So I want you to write this down. You're going to find this to be super straightforward when it comes to investing in real estate. There's a very simple four-part formula to this, all right? Step one, uh, the first part of this formula is you want to acquire a property with 25% down. In a, in a moment, we'll talk a little bit more about down payments, and I will tell you that there you can find programs out there where you can purchase with 20%, but really you should plan on at least 25% as your down payment. So part one of this formula is you wanna acquire a property with 25% down at least, you could certainly do more. Then the second part of the formula, you put a renter in the property, okay? There, there's some different ways to do that. And um, the different ways to do that is that, that you can do it yourself or you can hire a property manager. In a little bit, I'll, I'll show you more about the expense of hiring a property manager and what you can expect to pay them if you choose to go that route, but um, this would be part two of the formula. You put a renter in the property, then part three, you know what? Let your renter pay your mortgage down. So they are paying your rent every month. And um, in the case where you do have a mortgage on the property, and in most cases we, we find that, you can certainly purchase with cash and that, that's a really nice thing. But if you have a mortgage, what's happening is you're letting, you're letting your renter make your mortgage payment. Your renter is uh, paying that mortgage down for you. And so your principal balance is going down every single month, which means that that property is performing 
even without appreciation. So uh, part four of the formula is to let the appreciation be the icing on the cake. So you need to know, as we consult with you, as we talk to you about investing in real estate, what we know and what we, what we, the way we think about this and our approach that we have is that the appreciation is the icing on the cake. The cake itself is that that renter is in the property and they're paying that mortgage down for you. If you do it right, they're, they're um, also paying your expenses and, uh, and even creating a little bit of a cash flow, flow for you. But the cake is the fact that they're paying that mortgage down and it's causing that equity to build month after month after month. Your equity is building because your renter is helping you make that happen. Okay, the renter is doing that for you. And any appreciation is icing on the cake. And so th this is the mindset I had when I purchased my property that I, I showed you about is that the cake for me would be the fact that they're making those mortgage payments and they're paying my, my mortgage balance down every month. And if the, the property appreciated, if the market went up over time and, and I was confident that it would go up at least 5% per year, that for me was going to be the icing on the cake. All right. So that is the four part formula. There are two major money aspects to this. All right. So as you think about the money involved, there are two major money aspects, um, pretty straightforward. Number one is the down payment itself. And number two is the monthly payment. So, you know, as you think about the money that it takes to do this, these are the two things to focus on, the down payment and the monthly payment. So let's um, just take these one by one. Let's first look at the down payment. So um, for most mortgage programs out there, you're going to be looking at between 20% to 35% down. As I mentioned before, in most cases, it's 25%. There are some programs out there that allow for as low as 20%. And in some cases, you do, you do need to go up to as high as 35%. It's really going to depend on the loan program that you pick and also on your credit score. So the better your credit score, in many cases, the lower the down payment that you need to have. Um, the higher the, you know, the lower the credit score, the worse your credit, the more the down payment you need to have, right? Makes sense. Pretty straightforward. But the amount of money, the percentage that you should plan on as you think about uh, compiling the down payment to make this happen, the number you should plan on is 25%. So that's just a good rule of thumb. That's the number to focus on. That's the number to think about. So just for example, if you were thinking about a $300,000 rental property, 25% down would be $75,000. Okay, so $75,000 would be your down payment. Then there, you want to plan for another 2% on top of that for your closing costs. So then, of course, you're going to think about, well, well, where would that money come from? What's really great about real estate is that there are actually ways to invest in real estate inside of your IRA. So you may have an IRA or a 401k or some kind of retirement plan there are actually ways out there, um, ways for you to, instead of that money being in a mutual fund, for example, or, or inside of stocks, you can have that money in real estate. If you want to know more about that, you want to reach out to your Windermere broker. Um, that's how I own some of my uh, investment real estate is inside of an IRA. So that's one way. Other ways, maybe you may just have that money in savings or you may be able to um, save up some money. Maybe you're getting a, a bonus from, from work. Um, maybe um, you're getting some um, uh, some money from a relative and in some ways, um, um, you know, maybe in, in a sad case, maybe it was an inheritance. You know, maybe you've had some inheritance monies, maybe your relative passed away um, and you've you've um, come across some uh, some cash and, and some money. And so that this is that would be another source, of course, uh, way for you to do this. So 25 percent is the amount of money that you want to kind of target as you start to budget for your down payment. Now, the second aspect is your monthly payment, right? So we have the down payment, and now you have your monthly payment. So your monthly payment is, of course, dependent upon your interest rate. And the interest rate, just like the down payment, the interest rate that you can get from a bank, from your lender, it's really going to depend on both the loan type that you get and also your credit score. So uh, if you have great credit, you have the opportunity to get an even lower interest rate. If not so great credit, you're going to look at it at a higher interest rate, right? Pretty straightforward stuff, okay? Um, the other thing you should know is that investor rates tend to be higher than for your primary home. So usually by about a half a percent, it can kind of vary lender by lender, but you need to know as you're looking at rates for your primary home, you know, and, and rates that are published out there, rates that are being advertised and marketed, those are rates if someone is buying their primary home, 
investors are going to pay a little bit higher rate, usually about a, a half a percent. Okay. Now the um, the other thing too about today's environment is um, today's environment offers incredibly low interest rates, and that's why investing in real estate is so attractive right now because of how low rates are compared to their long-term average. Even though rates we've watched go up here recently and they're predicted to go up even higher, today's rate environment is incredibly attractive for the investor because rates today are running near half of their long-term average. So if you look at their 40-year average of the mortgage interest rate today, they're, they're roughly half of that long-term average. So rates today are, are super low. So just for example, if you had a $300,000 property, you put 25% down, that would mean a $225,000 loan. Let's say you were able to get an interest rate at 4.5%. If this was amortized over 30 years, your principal and interest payment would be $1,140. Okay, so then of course you, you would add the other expenses on top of that that we'll talk about here in just a moment. You would add your other expenses on top of that and then you evaluate that versus the rent that you believe that you would be able to get uh, for that property, okay? So that's just an example, $225,000 loan, your monthly payment you're looking at for principal and interest be, would be $1,140, okay? Now let's give you some numbers uh, to use in your budgeting, all right? As you, um, as you build out the model, as you start to um, kind of uh, sketch this out and see um, exactly what this looks like on a month-by-month -month basis. I'm going to give you two numbers that are, are really good to know. Uh, the first one is property managers. So when I say management here on the screen, what I mean is property managers. And if you're thinking about a property manager, what you should budget is 10%. Sometimes you'll find uh, management fees a little bit higher, sometimes a little bit lower, but just plan on 10%. So 10% of the monthly rent would be paid to the property manager. So what are they going to do for that 10%? Well, they're going to um, screen potential renters. They'll do things like run their, uh, their credit scores. They'll even check references. They'll handle all the marketing of the property. They'll field all the inquiries on the property. They'll show the property to potential renters. They have all the documents, you know, the, uh, the leases, the, the credit check documents. Um, so they will uh, help to select the renter. They'll put the renter in the property. They'll collect the security deposit. And then, of course, they'll collect the rent every month and they'll ensure that the rent is coming in. If there's ever a problem uh, with the rent, if the renter, renter isn't able to make the, the rent payment, and of course, they're going to be the ones doing the follow-up with them and, and assessing the penalties uh, in that case. So they do all those things for 10%. They uh, facilitate the move out of one renter and um, the transition to the new renter. They evaluate the property at the end of the lease to see if any money from the security deposit needs to be retained. Um, all of those things they do for you. And I, I found for me personally, I like having a property manager. I just don't have the time really to do all those things for my rental properties. Now, there are plenty of people that I know who like doing all that themselves, and they, they would rather not pay that 10%. They, they have the time and skill set and, and expertise to uh, handle all that themselves. They'd rather not hire a third party. They'd rather work with that tenant directly. Uh, they'd rather not pay the 10%. Um, so that also works. So I, what, I, what we recommend, our advice to you is just pick whatever method works best for you. Um, we know some people who start off managing the property the, on their own and they, then they decide later on, you know what, this is maybe a little bit more work than what I thought and, and it's gonna be worth it to me to hire the property manager for 10%, but <clears throat> that's the number that you wanna budget is 10% is for management. The other number that you wanna budget is maintenance. So we think a good number is 8%. So as you think about um, things that may be that you may have to do to the property um, for upkeep, you know, maybe it's um, new carpet when one renter moves out, maybe there's some touch-up painting, uh, maybe something with the landscaping, you know, whatever it is, uh, you want to budget 8% in your formula, you want to uh, budget 8% for maintenance, right? So those are two of, of the big numbers that you want to be aware of as you do your, do your budgeting. So again, 10% for management fee, 10% of the monthly rent, 8% is for maintenance, all right? Now, the good news for you is that we can do all this for you. So we have analysis tools, we have spreadsheets that we've built to help our investor clients 
uh, do all this analysis. So if your head's starting to spin a little bit and say, geez, this, this is um, going to take a lot to sit down and uh, do all this anal analysis, do this evaluation, the good news for you is that we can do this for you. We, we have a spreadsheet built where we can do this or we just plug in the numbers and the spreadsheet will show us what's going to be happening on a month-by-month -month basis. So what we want you to do is reach out to your Windermere broker when you are far enough along in the process, and, and we'll talk more about that. And I'll reach out to your Windermere broker, and they can sit down with you using this spreadsheet. They'll go through it with you. They'll plug in the numbers for you and show you uh, the results and show you how that property uh, is going to perform. All right? So here are the steps. Okay, so these are these are the five steps. These are really when you boil it down, this is what it takes um, to get started. These are the five things that you wanna do and you wanna do them in this order. And um, you do these five things and, and you're gonna be on your way, all right? And by the way, you're gonna find this to be super simple, really straightforward, nothing really earth shattering here. Step number one is you wanna clarify the outcome. <clears throat> this is so important uh, to do first. It's so important to have clarity on what it is that you really want to accomplish with this property. And it's different for every person. So it may be that you want to have this property to help fund your retirement. And you may have a certain date in mind that you're gonna retire. You may say, you know what, I'm gonna retire in 15 years or I'm gonna retire in 10 years. And I want this property to really help me out to be part of my, um, my part of my income when I'm retiring. And so that that's my outcome. It could be, you want to fund your child's education. We find that a terrific way to fund college is to buy a rental property. Could you imagine buying a rental property for your three-year-old and in 15 years, uh, when that three-year-old is now 18 years old and they're ready to go off to college, can you imagine what's now sitting there inside of that property, all the equity in that property that can help fund that child's education? And you know what, even if that child is 13, not three, this can still be a terrific vehicle to help fund a child's education. We have many clients who have set a simple goal that they want to have one rental property for each of their children to help fund their, their college. And, and maybe someday they'll pass it on to their child, but they want to be sure they're funding college. And what a terrific way and really straightforward, easy way to do that is to buy one rental property um, for each child. So again, we need to be clear on the outcome. What is it that you want to accomplish by, by owning this property? Maybe it's just you want to diversify. Maybe you feel like, gosh, I have so much money in the stock market. I just want to diversify. I want to have some of that money now in real estate. That's my outcome. Um, so we're going to clarify the outcome first. And then the second thing that we're going to have you do is we're going to have you get pre-qualified. You may have a relationship with the lender already. If you don't, there's some really terif terrific lenders that we can connect you with. We'll get you connected with a great lender who understands rental properties that can show you different programs to help you out. They'll help you look at, for instance, a 15-year versus a 30-year and all the different programs that are out there. We want to get you pre-qualified first. This must happen way up front in the process, certainly before we're out looking at properties, certainly before we're out trying to make offers on properties. We want to have that pre-qualification and even better, a pre-approval in our hand and done so we know exactly what you qualify for and that puts us in a much 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 better qualifying and, and uh, negotiating position with a potential seller all right so then once you've done that we're going to help you run the numbers now that we know kind of the price range you're going to be looking at we'll help you run the numbers we'll we'll put that price range through our model that we've built um, we will help you uh, look at projected rents for that property so we can know what the monthly revenue is going to look like. And we're going to help you with the evaluation. We're going to see how does this perform month by month? Is this um, uh, causing cash flow? Is it cash flow negative? Um, well, you know what? That's, that's not a good property. Let's go find another one. Let's, let's go find one that works. But we're going to run all these th properties through our model to ensure that it makes sense for you and um, ensure that it's gonna help you meet your goals, okay? So once we know what you can qualify for, we run the numbers um, so you can have a good idea of, of the properties that we now wanna go identify. So once we have a general sense of what the numbers look like, then we go hone in on specific properties and then we go acquire. And the way we do that, of course, is by making an offer and, and we'll go through those steps with you even before we get to step four in this process, we'll show you all the, the documents that are required to go make an offer. It's really straightforward. 
we already have our pre-approval in hand, puts us in a better negotiating position when we go out um, to acquire property. So once we know the numbers, we go out and we identify the property, then we acquire it, and we feel really confident that that property is going to perform because we've already run the numbers on it. So once we've identified it, we've acquired it, we've now closed on that property, what's next? Pretty simple. Now we put a renter in it, right? And you're either doing that yourself, either through your own, your own marketing and advertising and your own processes, and, um, and we, can, we can help you with that. Um, we can give you some, um, some good resources on, on where to go to, to be able to get some of these documents um, if you choose to go on your own, but you may be someone like me that chooses to hire a property manager. They'll help you put a renter in the property. Now your renter's in that property, and now they're helping you pay that mortgage down, right? So it's really that simple. I told you that this is going to be pretty, pretty straightforward. Nothing earth shattering here. These are the five really essential steps. So what's next for you after this, uh, after going through this and seeing how straightforward it is? Well, what's next for you is to connect uh, with your broker, right? So you want, you want to reach out to your Windermere broker who invited you onto this webinar, and you want to ask them for the investment checklist. So this is a really great way to start. We'll get that in your hands. It, it shows you everything that you need to think about to get started investing in real estate. Um, I'm guessing that this webinar alone is giving you um, the simple steps and investment checklist will, has a few more things on there, even more detail, shows you in writing exactly um, what needs to happen for you to get started. So that's a really nice resource for you. We also have um, a little white paper that we wrote that's in, about investing in real estate. So that's something else that our Windermere broker can get in your hand. And then after that, we'll help you get connected to a lender. So as we mentioned on the last slide, that's a really important step in the process. We want to do that very early on. And even if you're not 100% sure that this is something that you want to do, this is a great way to get started just so you understand what it looks like on a monthly payment business, uh, monthly payment basis and also what interest rates look like, what the different programs are, we can connect you to a lender so that you have a whole lot of clarity about all those components, all right? So we'll get the investment checklist in your hands, we'll connect you with the lender, and then if you wanna take the next step, what we'll do is we'll run the numbers for you. We'll, we can even start by running some hypothetical numbers. Um, you know, let's pretend it's a $325,000 property, and this is what we think the monthly expenses are going to be based on the model that we have. And then this is what we think it's going to rent for. What does that look like? Does that look like this is going to perform the way we want it to? Does it look like it's going to help us meet our goals? All right. So that's that's really it. That's really um, the simple next steps. You want to uh, connect with your Windermere broker. They'll get the investment checklist in your hands. They will connect you uh, with the lender if you want to see more about how this works. And then they'll be there to help you uh, run the numbers. So we are at about um, 45 minutes after the hour. And so now we have uh, now plenty of time to answer any questions that you have. And I knew that um, the, uh, the question component would be a really valuable time here. And I know lots of people are going to um, uh, go to benefit from the questions and hearing the questions. So um, go ahead and type in a question to me. If there's something on your mind, something uh, that I can help you with, um, maybe something that uh, that wasn't covered, uh, maybe something that um, uh, you want a little more clarity on, maybe you know something I did bring up, but something you want to get more clarity on, I'm more than happy to help with all that. And what I have here on my screen is a little dashboard that will show me the question that you can uh, that you can type into me. So if you have a question, just go ahead and type it in. I'll be able to uh, help you out. So, oh, great question. So here's a question that came in. Is the analysis the same for commercial real estate investing? Yeah, absolutely. It's all the same principles. You know, we, we you know, it's simply looking at uh, revenue and expense then leads you to net income on a, on a monthly basis. So we can absolutely plug in commercial numbers, um, you know, based on a certain purchase price and a certain amount down and, and we could do things like evaluate cap rates for you. So yeah, terrific question. Absolutely. It, it's the same uh, with commercial real estate. Um, let's see. Here's a question. Uh, where's a good place to look for rental rates for a neighborhood? Well, uh, kind of depending on where you are along the front range, 
there are a lot of websites out there um, wh where renters list their property for rent. So, for example, Northern Colorado, um, I believe it's nocorentals.com. Uh, That's a good place to do some uh, some evaluation um, for rentals. But it kind of depends on where you are in in uh, along the front range. And uh, I think it's something that's pretty easily searchable online, something that we can um, pretty easily uh, find that. So, um, all right. So, um, yeah, d a, d a comment came in that someone, they always start by looking at Craigslist. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the question came in, does the model consider tax implications? Yes, uh, it certainly does. Um, there are tax benefits to owning real estate. Um, absolutely, there are. Um, didn't I chose not to get specifically into that today, just to keep this, um, you know, on a, on a really basic level. And, and what I know is that the the real estate will perform even uh, without considering those tax um, implications. But the tax benefits make it uh, perform even better. So the, the model that we have, yes, it does take uh, taxes into uh, consideration. Um, so um, let's see; those are the uh the questions so far i'll just uh give another moment to uh to see if there's any other uh any other questions that are that are coming in um you know one, one thing that that comes up too I, just thinking about um how I, I talked about the stock market um you know stock market versus real estate is um you know number one i believe in diversity right we we never want to have all of our eggs in one basket i you know personally i sleep well at night knowing that i have some money in the stock market and i have some money in real estate i like having money in both and and one of the beauties of real estate that you know it, i guess i alluded to when i talked about my own personal example but to be a little more specific about it one of the beauties of real estate is is leverage right so you think about that little 1100 square foot home that cost $180,000, but I was able to acquire it for $63,000 was, was my down payment. So, you know, even though prices are going up, um, you know, on average, I mentioned a little over 5% per year, prices are doing that. But if you were to do the ROI on my $63,000 uh, over that time was was over 20% per year on, on my down payment. So that that's another beauty of real estate is is leverage. The fact that you can acquire these properties for 25% down in most cases, maybe it's, even if it's 30, you can um, realize a much better ROI um, on that down payment than 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 simply what the the stock market uh, may be doing. Um, let's see. Um, the uh, great question that uh, came in. So. How do you invest in a market that's that's so competitive? Well, you know what? The the reality is the market absolutely is competitive. It's competitive because it's in such high demand. You know, the the front range is very popular. Lots of people are moving here for various reasons. Most importantly, we have a very healthy economy. We have low unemployment here. Companies are are growing. We have a diverse economy. We're not reliant up, upon just one industry. Tech our wonderful quality of life on top of that, and that means a whole bunch of people are moving here. That means that the housing market is competitive. So the way that you compete is, uh, boy, it's just like on a primary residence. Number one is we got to be prepared, right? So we have to be prepared with a pre-approval that will make our offer stand out. We also need to really know our numbers. So in a competitive environment, sometimes you need to um, uh, bid at asking price and sometimes even higher than list price in order to be the winning offer. And before we're doing things like that, we need to really know our numbers. So we need to know what price makes sense and what price does not make sense. We need to understand our ceiling um, going into that environment so that we don't overpay, so that it, it hurts us on a monthly basis. So then our, um, you know, that, that uh, investment is not performing because we paid too much for it based on what we believe the rents are going to be. So we just really got to be prepared. We got to understand our numbers uh, up front. Um, great question. Should someone start small with a condo or duplex versus diving into a single family home? I, I, all right, here's what I think. I think that someone can easily start with a condominium or single family home. 
there's some advantages to either one. What I recommend is that you invest in one of those two things before you start investing into things like land or big apartment buildings. You know, once you start doing things like that, then that becomes much more risky. But in terms of risk, I really view a, a condominium and a single family home as the same. Some people like the thought of investing in a condominium because you have the HOA that's going to be taking care of a lot of the maintenance for you. You know, they're taking the lead on things like the roof and the painting of the exterior, the landscaping around the property. So they like the thought of a condominium because they, they see that it's going to be a little less maintenance, a little less, a little less time intensive because the management company for the HOA is handling those things. But in terms of risk, I really see them uh, being the same. Um, a condominium or a single family home, but that that was a terrific uh, question. Great question. Uh, let's see here if any other questions uh, roll in. And, and thank you for the questions, by the way. I know I know that everyone gets a benefit when the questions are asked. Um, let's see. I'm not right now. I'm not seeing any questions. So if you have more questions, you are welcome to reach out to me. I'm going to show you my email address here. Um, there's my email address. You're welcome to reach out to me or more importantly, reach out to your Windermere broker. So for most of you listening, you had a Windermere broker uh, that invited you on here. They're, they're really savvy when it comes to investing in real estate. They can help you out. They have these resources that I mentioned to you and they can help you. So what I want to do now is just say thanks. I want to say thank you so much for your engagement um, that was uh, really terrific. Again, a bunch of people registered for this. Um, and, and I know a lot of you are going to be listening to the recording as well. Um, uh, you should know that even if you uh, li are listening live, you're, you will receive an email with a recording of the session. You should get that uh, within an hour of, of us uh, wrapping up here. So again, my name is Eric Thompson. So appreciative of your engagement through this. Um, happy to help you with any questions uh, that you have. And I want you to enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. Bye.